Okay. Okay. Right. Welcome everybody to the last general committee meeting of 2020, which has been quite an extraordinary year. Congratulations on making it. <laughs> Begin with uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gubby Gubby or the Cuddy Cuddy people, who pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Just a gentle reminder, please turn your phones off or on silent, or if that's not possible, can that they be out of the room, please? Um, and also for conflicts of interest to be declared. We have, um, first up item is the confirmation of the minutes from the meeting held on the 16th of November. Yeah. Moved Councillor Finzel, seconded by Councillor Lawrenson. Any discussion? All in favour? That's carried. We have no presentations, no deputations. The first item is um, referred from the Environment and Planning Committee. Development application for material change of use for commercial business type one office, multiple housing type four, conventional and retail business type two, shop and salon at six to ten Diamond Street, Karoi, referred due to the significance of the issue. And welcome Glenn and Kerry, thank you for being here. Oh, and yes. Claire, yes. Um, I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as Peter Ziff, a director of Creek Gold, PTY Ltd who donated to my election campaign in March 2020, has an interest in this application. Mr Ziff attended the pre-lodgement meeting on behalf of the applicant. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Glenn and Kerry. Here to answer any questions, councillors have. Joe. Um, first one, Glenn. Uh, I notice in the report there's a number of conditions uh, recommend, re recommended, but uh, are all of those conditions? Do all of those conditions appear in the conditions for approval? Um, it's been brought to my attention that the end of trip facilities that was mentioned in the body of the report had been overlooked in the condition. So there is, I sent an amended condition around this morning that included the end of trip facilities as well as um, the required number of um, bicycle spaces so, as well. So the recommendations with regard to waste um, waste water treatment uh, or sort of storm water treatment is there under storm drainage the height. Uh, uh, being recommended uh, at eight metres when this one is over eight point uh, is over eight metres. That, 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 as a result of that, the, the plans have to be redrawn by the applicant and, and amended to until they're approved. Uh, as part of the operational prior to the issue, of the operational works and plans will be submitted, and they will need to comply with that condition of eight metres above the uh, natural ground level. Okay, so the things like the waste management plan and, and needing to. Um, I haven't asked this before, but I just it just came to my attention. I haven't asked it. Um, it talks about segregated waste, subtracting significantly reduced disposal fees at the landfill, and higher gate fees for mixed waste and the like. But is that actually enforced? Do we do we do we ensure that they do have a uh, an element of recycling within their waste plan, or if they decide not to do that and they're prepared to pay the fees, do we accept that? Um, our that environment department. The, the applicant provides that, that waste segregation table uh, to our environment department downstairs. So it's to the applicant's um, advantage is to separate the waste. But the, the question is, do we, uh, do we have the capacity to enforce that the recycling is undertaken or do we just accept whatever they put in that if they're prepared to pay the fee? That's it. They... So we do require that um, with the design that the waste storage areas for the different components are actually I'm not talking about storage areas, I'm talking about the, the, the removal and demolition. Demolition. Oh. Elements. These ones here. You have to have a materials on site, expected uh, removal of, uh, of those sure uh, items and, and, and a breakdown, reuse and recycling or disposal. But if they don't reuse, if they, if they don't have a commitment to reuse or recycle, do we have the ability to condition that they must? Um, Sorry, it's a question on uh, without that without notice, but it's, yeah. it's something that came to my attention this morning as I was reading through it again. 
Good question, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> um, we may need to come back on no, back to you on that, this. That's fine. I'd, I'd yeah. appreciate some sort of response on yeah. that. I, I've got no idea. I know that the that within the report we get this form. Yeah. But I may not be on that. I'm unaware whether it actually what level of recycling is undertaken when mm. demolitions are. Yeah. Uh, in process and where the people are seeking to save these. Mm. Sorry? That was me. Sorry. Oh. Where the people are seeking to save yeah. the fees or are just paying the fees and yeah. dumping it we'll, regardless. We'll whether, whether we're having a, an impact on uh, on, re, on on the recycling of uh, recycling material, yeah. of materials uh, in that situation. We'll come back to you on that one after we've talked to our waste area. Thank you. I think I had one more so question. Can I just double check on that one? Can we include just the ability under a planning approval to condition mandatory recycling, or can we only just require them to include the facility? That'd be something I'd be interested in, because we know that business recycling is a is a low um, is an area that we're trying to increase significantly, and it might be if it is a um, permissible condition to actually have the behaviour conditioned, then that might start mm. the process. Mm. Okay. And so, yeah, I, I guess the uh, the final question was what I, I the one I think. So all the rec all the rec recommendations in the report, apart from the one that we've picked up, are Correct. somewhere within the in the conditions of the report. So, yes. and yes, they will have to revise their drawings to reduce the height to below eight metres. Correct. Thank you. Can we see the amend the amendment that you circulated this morning, where it sits in this recommendation, please? Oh, um, I think Brian's going to... That, that's what I did. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was from Glenn. It sits in there. That's my request. Well, I don't recall receiving that. It came out very early, uh, just this morning, because of... Pathway connection? Yes. Yeah, I raised a question this morning as well. So it's on the screen now. Changes are not just written. Oh, yeah, thank you. In, in uh, condition 42. It's going to be in paragraph, the introduction is the same, condition 42, in paragraph 8, a minimum 1.5 metre wide in some covered pathways within the development site, including a minimum of a 2 metre wide pathway connected to Diamond Lane, generally in accordance with the approved plans, then B and C is as per the, um, the agenda, and then D reads a total of 11 bicycle parking spaces slash racks and end of trip facilities complying with the applicable standards in the NUSA plan 2016. And if I could just just put up the image from the NUSA plan 2020 just to give you the, the basis of requiring that slightly wider pathway. You'll see there on that, that's from the 2020 uh, NUSA Crawley Framework and Character Plan in the NUSA plan and the sort of uh, vertical dash green line shows that between this side and the other commercial site there is a desire to have a key pedestrian and cycle link and so in the other development uh, number three on that map we did require a two metre path linking to um, Diamond Lane and this would just make it easier for uh, the width would make it easier to say for a, a pedestrian and a bike uh, to pass on that lane that we're going out of this development. Apologies Mr Chair, there was one more question if I may. Of course. Um, figure 5 on page 16 of the report. It identifies the subject site with the red perimeter over the three lot, but I notice there's some red hashed sections as well. Can you clarify what the intent of those red hashed um, the areas were? Were they pathways or linkages? No, they're uh, easements for, they could, it, it could be sewerage. Easements that they could use or will use. They're not part of the application, no. the, ha the hatched areas. They're yeah. just easements showing up on our mapping system that exist today. So what's the purpose of showing them in Figure 5 in relation to this application? I overlooked switching the easement overlay off, Joe. Okay. That's all right. That's, I, thought, that's, I was sort of <laughs> looking back to are they part of the yeah. application? or So that's what confused me. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. That's, that's why I was confused. Amazing. Um, just a question, mainly for the benefit of the viewers. Um, is the development built for climate change impacts and do we have the authority to condition development to incorporate um, sustainability principles including energy efficiencies um, and connectivity? Um, 
Un under the superseded planning scheme, we, we have um, limited ability to what's, um, what provisions there are in the planning scheme. Uh, the, the, the current design does provide for uh, flow through ventilation, uh, a certain amount of openings in each bedroom, north-south alignment, they've got the, the northern veranda out the front and the, the windows and uh, a door to the south. Um, in terms of lighting, uh, internal lighting and that sort of thing, there's, there's no provision in the superseded planning scheme. Um, noting that um, the current <coughs> scheme uh, does have some more provisions in there, but it's still very limited because of the um, provisions that the state government put on uh, the planning scheme at the time. So we're limited in the ability because they're building assessment provision, which our planning scheme cannot override. Yeah. But yeah. I'll just add yeah. to that. Uh, you might recall that um, when the council did uh, was going through the, the planning scheme process for our, our new planning scheme, in our first iteration of that, which we sent to the state government, we included a range of, I'll call them sustainability measures in terms of building design, which was, you know, through solar, water retention, things like that. Um, the state government said that they would not approve the scheme with those in there because they believe that that should be a uniform approach to all building codes across the whole of Queensland. And if there is a, ever going to be that requirement, that should be standardised across the whole of the state through the building provisions, not through individual council planning schemes. Okay. It's unfortunate that that's the way it is. Okay. Sorry. I think everyone would have liked to have seen something like so that. So is there yeah. an opportunity for us then to lobby local government association? Um, yeah, sure, to, absolutely. Yeah. But there are elements that we include in our planning scheme, such as the need for eaves and things like that, that are uh, yeah, ensure um, shading and, uh, and lessening the need for uh, air conditioning and the like. In regard to this development, they, they are providing there's um, two conditions to require them to provide rainwater harvesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that will be also in accordance with their stormwater management plan, but it's also a harvesting provision as well. Um, there is, as I said, there's um, a greater ability in the Noosa Plan 2000. And Was that something uh, undertaken 20... by the developer or something by council? <coughs> uh, what rainwater harvesting? Um, it's, it's a condition for our stormwater. Uh, okay. With our hydrologist, yes, okay. we have Just that talk. ability. Just a quick question about um, electric cars and um, the, the charging uh, component. Is that something that 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 the planners would have to look at, or is that just you know the, if if somebody happens to have a or purchases a Tesla and they want to charge it there, would they personally put into it, or does that have to be part of the overall planning scheme to have a charging unit. Uh, correct. It would need to be in, in our planning scheme to require that, that provision for the electric vehicles. Uh, we have some charging stations throughout the Shire that have just been put put in on, on the back of the, um, the owner or the developer. Um, I think there's a service station along the Monday Noosa Road that's got a, a charge station. Uh, that, that We did not require that, but that's what they wanted to do. It's actually one about 100 metres away from yeah, the site. Yeah. It's just one across the road. Yeah. It's actually been installed, yeah. 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 yeah, didn't originally. Um, I've got a question in relation to, it's, I think page 26 is probably the best to look at. Um, I didn't twig um, in terms of Joe's question on the height, and this links once again to sustainable building design. It, here's the only diagram we've got of building height which gives an indication of the area of non-compliance is those elevations on page 26 that put our east and west elevation. I'll just wait for it to come up here. So that middle one there. There's quite a lot on height either, that's why I was... So from, and uh, uh, the question is, and it's marked there as 8.35 metres. So my question is, is the only non-compliance a this much of the peak correct and um, to achieve that to achieve eight meters they would reduce the the pitch of the roof and therefore reduce the actual um, ceiling space in terms of ventilation and all that sort of stuff but also the design to me if it that that I take it that runs for some it looks like from the other elevations it only runs for part of the north-south elevation too, it's not a very long, or is it a long section that's above the eight? Don't you peak on the residential section on that front, from what I can 
gather their from. Yeah, so just we just that that's I'm I, I'm very partial to allowing increases in height of roofs if um, if it achieves a design objective which this appears to do and adds to variation on roof form. But I'm just not sure what because we haven't got that same yeah. view from the from the north or south that I can see. I'm not sure how how much would be non-compliant. Can you explain? Uh, there's not a great deal of non-compliance. It is the uh, uh, the difference in roof form between the two uh, components of the residential units. There's two units with um, one roof form and another two with a separate roof form. Yep. Um, but you're correct. There's not. It's not mm. clearly shown on the, uh, the plans of uh, how much of the roof is um, exceeds the eight meters. So in mm. the is it something you could bring back to Thursday, a condition which would allow them that level of non-compliance? Like if I just put 8.35, then the whole lot could be 8.35, but could you bring potentially bring yeah. a condition that on Thursday? Yeah, yeah I, I'd like that level of detail as well, because otherwise, uh, it's, right. normally it's buildings don't exceed 8 meters above the ground level. Uh, we need to understand how much non-compliance uh, yeah, I mean, from the Brian's raised a good point from the east and west elevation. I can't see it on the northern elevation. I can't see it on a on any other elevation. That the, the, the point where where the peak is, and it only seems to be a peak from the east and the west is visible, mm. but you can't see it on a north south trajectory. So it's a little difficult to tell. I agree. So in the meantime, do we have a movement for this recommendation as a motion as it stands? Do you want to? Do that, defer. or do you want to defer the motion to Thursday to get that oh, additional yeah, information? Yeah. Yeah. That would be better. I think okay. that would be my suggestion. Yeah. I'm happy to move that deferral, but do we want to have further yeah. Yeah. questions first? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, going back to the uh, reference to uh, compliance to the council's policy on emissions, reaching zero emission targets, and that state has put, you know, let limits on our ability to be able to do that case by case. Is there any way we could condition the applicant to consider his behaviour moving towards the future in considering in ways that this development might um, provide zero emission carbon offsets back to either that development or our community? Just as a leading example to show a direction regarding our own policies and design principles in Noosa Shire, which leads the way. Is there any opportunity we can possibly do that? Well, that's really what um, the new scheme tried to do, tried to introduce these sorts of requirements for development in the Shire. Mm. Um, but that's what, as Brett explained, that's what the state has said um, no to, that we can't mm. include it in our individual planning schemes, that this has to happen at a state level. Yeah, I understand that, but is there like a, I don't know, a sort of like a goodwill gesture from the applicant to consider that in the like costing? I think, thing? I think if your your question is, you know, what, what could we condition? Mm. We can only condition what the planning scheme allows us oh, to condition. Okay, okay. So we yeah. can't yeah. enforce yeah. something that is, is not covered by the planning scheme. We just can't introduce other issues over, above that. Oh, okay. <coughs> um, I would suggest that's 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 nothing preventing an applicant from... Yeah, whether the, one, one at a time, perhaps. Whether the applicant then chooses for good business practices or their brand management, whatever it might mm. be, to go over and above that and to introduce design characteristics that um, you know create a, a better environmental footprint, that's that would be great. But mm. the question is, what we can and can't condition really depends on what the planning scheme allows us to do. So. Okay, thank you. And Kerry, so when you talk to applicants that are putting forward these um, design things in our shire, mm. do you have these discussions with them? Regarding that, even though we can't condition it mm. in that conversation. Yeah, yeah. and and some of some applicants are quite open to exploring it, but others immediately ask us where it is in the planning scheme. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Amelia. Um, a, a question in regard to environmental guidelines um, and in regards to construction activities. There's a risk that the construction activities are going to adversely impact on the residences. So I had a drive through, gone and looked at the site quite a few times, and there's a beautiful pocket down Diamond Lane residential properties. Mm. So I'm a, um, my question is um, potentially um, these residents are going to be adversely affected by construction activities. 
what complaint processes or communication processes are in place by the developer where these residents have an opportunity to um, process a complaint mm -hmm. or at least have some idea of who to complain to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the developer is required to have a construction management plan. Yep. Um, so that details how they're really going to um, address you know complaints received dealing with residents how they're going to manage their from where their workers are parking on site or where they park during construction um, sediment erosion um, so that plan really deals with uh, those issues are there penalties imposed on developers who don't follow through on that Kerry they must have a construction management plan before we will issue their operational works and do their pre-start so they must have that in place does that include notifying the residents in advance of any sort of nuisance or construction activities that they see as going to negatively impact them? Yeah, uh, there's a contact, but not typically notifying them in advance. So okay. no, um, that would be something we'd have to specifically ask them to do. Okay. Joe, well, my understanding is that um, the state of uh, required uh, uh, some turning lanes and that that will be imp uh, impacting on uh, on the changes to the traffic management of uh, uh, traffic flow on that, uh, that street out front? Um, on, on Diamond Street there are going to be some uh, a median in it's a so the development will end up with a left in left out situation uh, but there's not going to be any change in Diamond Lane yeah. because there's only pedestrian access to Diamond Lane from this development. I'm assuming that's along the lines of what Councillor Orriston was talking about in yeah. reference to the sort of impact it would have. So how does something like that get notified to the community mm. that there are changes yeah. coming to the traffic management for the street yeah. that as a result of this development? Well, um, I suggest that we, we look at a further amendment for Thursday night that's to specifically great. raise this up issue and ask them to notify residents that before they start construction. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back with an amendment for you. Well, that, so I'm assuming that wasn't part of the MCU or wouldn't have been part of any um, uh, community uh, feedback potential? Uh, the, the application was, was publicly notified so the immediately adjoining neighbours uh, get notified and then you've got the sign, the development sign goes up on each of the street frontages and it gets um, notified in the local paper. But the traffic arrangements of the street, would they be yeah. part of Yes, that? they would have been, okay. yes. But not specifically what the amendment may consider is to actually, in the construction management plan, is to notify um, surrounding residences of any changes that may occur well, again, due to this development. Well, change in the yeah. street so to, uh, that, yeah. that, that will impact on uh, all yeah. traffic using that street. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Um, Two further questions. Um, one with regard to uh, waste that uh, talks about not using Diamond Lane, but what are the current waste uh, collection arrangements? Is Diamond Lane used as a waste uh, collection point? Yeah, I spoke with Waste about this, and they they do go down Diamond Lane, uh, but they don't. They only take um, a certain number of bins at the back, and others are accessed from the front. Uh, this current so both both are used. So. Yes. If it was all Diamond Lane, I'd wonder why Diamond Street was being used. But if it's a mix of Diamond Lane and Diamond Street, I'm not, probably not as, not as concerned. So. And also remembering that this is a, um, a commercial development, so the, 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 the generation of the waste trucks and the amount of waste is different as well. And, and we've got um, residential de de development on the eastern end of mm -hmm. uh, Diamond Lane. Mm -hmm. so. Um, it, it was a balance of um, reducing the impact on those residents as well. It's been demonstrated in the, in the application that the waste trucks can get on site safely. And, um, so they'll, they'll actually come into the site, not that, off the street. Because my concern was that on street parking, yeah. the rest tried to negotiate bins on Diamond Street. No, no, we ensured that um, as part of the assessment that the, the waste truck can come onto site into the back area is that back of house area behind the bigger tenancy and they can turn around and uh, drive out in a full so not, gear. not right at the back of the uh, development actually on Diamond Lane but the back of the so the, the, the rear of the premises that front Diamond Street. Street correct yeah, okay. yes okay thank you uh, the last question is um, and I'm pretty sure that it has been done I'm pretty sure we've had it confirmed in the past but I'll ask the question 
Uh, this site was an energy site. Um, my recollection is there was potential for contamination on the site as a result of the industrial activities going on in the, there in the past, but the site has been cleaned up. Have we confirmed that the site has the relevant contamination cleanup certificate? Uh, the site, uh, through our planning legislation, the site's required to go through a material change of use through the state. And so there's a condition um, included that uh, uh, ensures that that contaminate, that further application is um, is gained. So it's all been assessed and all ticked. Tick yeah. Tick. That's right. Just, just yeah. wanted to confirm that that has been No, it's, sorry, it, it hasn't been assessed yet. That will be a separate application yeah. to the state. Um, to look at contamination on the site and clean it up if necessary. So it's okay. not necessary. Oh, my understanding is it's already been undertaken on the site. That's not our knowledge. Prior to the current uses being allowed on the site, historically, no. Uh, no, my understanding. We sorry, we went to the the state about this um, in case that we had done a mist referral, which is a referral. Um, that runs concurrently with our application and the state came back and said that you need a completely separate application um, and my understanding is that it hasn't been cleaned up it hasn't been clean cleared up okay because that's different to yeah. my understanding was before yeah. we permitted the current uses on the site that have been ongoing since energex has left and the because there are activities occurring on the site including uh, mm. real estate activities and things like that I, my understanding was that the site had been cleared of contamination mm -hmm. before they were allowed. So if you can, can confirm what the uh, yeah. the process yeah. is in that regard, it would be appreciated. Yeah. And knowing that we do make sure that we get the tick. Yeah, it's our understanding any, any that it hasn't occurs. hasn't been cleaned up. And when the decision notice goes out, it will have a list of further development permits that the developer is required to obtain. Okay. And one of those will be All right, the okay. decontamination. Okay, that was a yeah. different understanding. Council Tom. Yeah. Oh, um, can we look at figure five, please, and pull it up? And I'm just going to, uh, on page 16. And I'd like everybody, I went around there this weekend, and just look, and, and so the question concerning the, the hotel site here where the hotel burned down, is the, where is the, the traffic going to come in and out of, out of this one? And the reason I ask this is I'm just looking at how much is going to come down Calvary Street. How much more traffic is going to come down Calvary Street and turn right or left <coughs> up there? Which is, you know, it's a pretty clear view looking both ways, but truly all this, everything here will end up here, Calvary Street. And so we're looking at a real, like we're to, we're, we don't want to have a rat run, as we say, but it, 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 it's just a, it, it's all going to end up right there. So I'm just wondering here, and I'm just, Okay, so that's the first question. The second question is, is this a, a, a little bit piecemeal in that this place is the, the news agent and that will eventually be re redone. And so the trash trucks will, will come into here, probably take the trash from here, the rubbish, and go out. Would it be better to have a, a master plan for this site, this site, this site, and this site working together? I know that, I know it's big, but is that possible? And I'll, I'll deal with the second one and you deal with the first one. <laughs> um, they're all different ownerships. Yeah, of course. That's the issue. Course. So unless you get one, you can only deal with the application that's in front of you at the time. Yeah. Um, so unless the, there was a joint application which involves an, what are called integrated development across multiple owners, then really we can only deal with the application that's in front of us. But we do so knowing that there'll be further redevelopment of those sites at some stage. So Glenn, you want to deal with yeah, the traffic? Yeah, and, and I guess just to expand on that, yeah. um, that's really what sort of streetscaping projects are all about too, is to develop that master plan so it all works together. Um, this obviously hasn't been done for this area, and as Brett indicates, we're, we're having to deal with individual owners as they lodge, um, and in the absence of a master plan, you achieve the best outcome you can um, as a whole for the, for the area. Um, I'll probably just ask, in terms of your first question, why do you think it's all going to end up in Cary Street? Because if, if you want to go to Noosa, the only way to get there is up Cary Street. Or you turn right at Diamond Street and go the other way. You, you, can, you, can, you can turn right there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you turn right into Elm Street. Elm Street. On Elm Street. So so you're from you're Diamond Street. From Diamond, Diamond Street, you turn right. And then you go around the block. That That's way. right. So yeah. there's two options. Except the right turn from Diamond Street is one of the worst 
right turns in the shire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, true. Okay. Then the next question is where there is this if, if there's gonna be stoplights, yeah. Um, will there be there will, where will they go so that if the, the, the traffic doesn't back up past here, you know, if, as, when this is red and these people I am sure you've thought about that, but is that is that a, a something that, that you think about when giving it doing a, a development application? Okay. Well, yeah, I need between just to give an overview of the traffic management review. Yeah, okay, so we sent this to a, our external consultant um, and it also went to the main roads department who, this is their jurisdiction, this road. Uh, so we encourage the applicant to look at using Diamond Lane. Um, we went to our external traffic consultant. Um, he wasn't convinced that that was the right way to go, but they looked at that opportunity. And it came back that, as a whole, it was better to spread the traffic out, coming from the development, rather than pushing it down either Diamond Lane coming, you know, one way from west to east or east to west. Uh, that type of um, future planning hasn't really been undertaken at this point. Um, so the main roads department uh, came back and said that they were happy with whatever their future planning was for the intersection of Diamond Street and Elm Street um, with the addition of the, the medium strip opposite this direction as a left in left out because there wasn't the sight lines and the safety to turn right into Diamond Street from the development. So it was more about spreading the traffic out rather than funneling it into specific uh, laneways or streets around this area. So traffic leaving this site will not be, uh, not be enabled to turn right. That's a result of the mm. stuff that main roads have required, required to be to that, be built in the way of medians to prevent yeah. that right. That's right. And, and that's part of the main roads' assessment as well, is to whether they felt it was safe and, and how the intersection would uh, would work as well. So we, it's I think Holland Traffic Consulting, um, they were the ones that undertook this report. So their report when I read it said that um, they consider the increase in traffic volume to be minor, not problematic. Can we hold them to that? Or can we <laughs> that? Um, but, but can we um, ask for a review of that, at least as a condition of the application, so that on the on chance that, you know, um, COVID produces another 3,000 residents in the Karoi Precinct, and given that the Gem Life development um, is coming to council for approval, is there an opportunity for us to ask for a uh, um, a revision of that report and um, make that a condition of the, of the application. Um, our external, the, the applicants provide us with all the information they feel is required yep. and then um, if, if needed we will then go out and have that reviewed. So it's the, the professional opinion of our external consultant yep. to say <coughs> that what the applicant is providing is within you know the guidelines or you know relevant standards etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, i think to provide a condition that this development will not um, will retain its minor increase in traffic um, would be an unreasonable condition to uh, impose. But a revision of a traffic plan, in, in, not yet. Yeah. No, um, no, we can't. We can't do it because conditions have to have certainty for the developer. Okay. So they have to be finite, so they know when they have an approval and they yep. start construction, the goalposts aren't going to mm. change. So we can't ask for a review in the future. We really have to make that assessment now yeah. okay. and make um, you know the best decision we can based on the information we have. And that's what we've done. We've had a, the applicant's traffic engineer review it. We have had an external traffic engineer. In this instance, Main Roads has also reviewed it. Um, so this this is the best based on the best information we have today. Well, and what they do is to look at you know what's the I call it carrying capacity. <coughs> what's the capacity of the number of vehicles that come in and out, and then look at how that impacts on the traffic network in that area based on yeah. various models. And, and yeah, so they've all three of them had a look at it. 
okay. about the same conclusion. Right. Yeah, um, a couple of things. I think Councillor Wigner's comment, the, um, firstly, history. I think the hotel that burnt down, if you're talking about the historic one, was on the corner where the service station is. The motel that was demolished is on that corner between Elm and Opal Street, and, and my recollection is the major access to that development is from Opal Street, uh, but there is a secondary access off Diamond Lane for a couple of uses at the back. Um, when we look at traffic in this area, you have to remember this at one stage was the um, sole route in and out of Croy, and in, it was the, uh, the Bruce Highway. Um, just having a quick look, I would suggest that Diamond Street was designed so that a bullock dray could do a U-turn. Mm -hmm. It means it's 40 metres wide. Probably. So if you look at a, a 40 metre wide road, that was designed in the old days to, I know Maple Street's like this, to, so a bullock dray could come in town and do a U-turn. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there is actually a very wide road reserve to be able to cater in terms of turning lanes, parking. So there probably isn't that significant uh, issue about trying to squeeze in a uh, uh, manoeuvring with loss of car parking, etc. So to me, yes, there is probably a potential that the people doing the loop through Cowrie Street will affect it. But um, I suppose the the nature of this being the the commercial centre of um, part of the commercial centre of, of Croy always means there will be some uh, increased traffic as the town develops. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think Curry Street has quite a bit of traffic now mm, with, nice. with people circulating and I think mm. that once we see that Diamond Street, Elm Street intersection upgraded that um, will potentially reduce that somewhat because the intersection will function better and people are trying to avoid mm. that intersection mm. at the mm. moment. Could that intersection um, involve a U-turn? That intersection yeah, between Street. That'll be, that'll be up to. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Joe. Uh, given the image on page 26 reflects a possible usage of the left hand side building as a convenience store, is that envisaged as something being large enough for a small scale supermarket, i.e., um, IGA or L? <coughs> Because um, I know Aldi, we, there has been talk of something like an Aldi or a supermarket, um, at least a small scale supermarket going on this site. I didn't look at the actual floor area of the site. Yes, you, you haven't, haven't, you you haven't you looked at the floor area. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm wondering about the, the, the volume of traffic that may use it. If that's, the, that's a, it's going to be a supermarket in town. Yeah. The potential yeah. for uh, traffic is, is significant. Yeah. Um, it's 350 square metres, uh, Councillor. That's very local. Um, I'm not sure if um, someone like uh, Aldi, I'm not sure if that would be a large enough footprint for, for Aldi, so but it would be a, a, a small yeah. scale, very small yeah. scale boutique type. And I think, you know, the, the current owner owns the other supermarkets in town, so I think that will <laughs> limit okay. what goes in here. Okay, okay. okay. so that, that, that's where yeah. it And I, I think there is probably a need for a bit of a convenience store on this side of town for residents mm -hmm. as well. So I don't... I was wondering what scale of convenience store it was going to be, so if it's, if it's going to be that small, it's probably not going to yeah. be. Yeah, so I wouldn't have any concerns right. about it going okay. in there. Um, I, I note and I think it's quite unusual that the developer in this instance, and I commend him for it, um, took in consideration existing um, tenancies and businesses around this precinct. So there's to avoid duplication of services. Um, and to me, that's someone that's part of a community and someone who understands um, how successful businesses are run. So I commend that and I encourage that for all developers because duplication in services and businesses results in shutdowns. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, I agree with you. I think the developer has a real passion and yeah. this application has been in with us for some time and one thing we haven't spoken about is the design of the building um, and there was a lot of work done with the developers agreement to come up with a design that would fit in with this area because it was actually very hard to design for given the sort of mix matching mm. development in that strip. Yep. Um, so I think great job to the developer in, in, in pursuing and, and keeping with that to come up with a design that was um, going to work for the site. I agree. And to follow up, the other part we haven't mentioned is the fact that it is a great demonstration of both the, the, the typical character and the sort of you know, reflection Very of the vernacular, <laughs> but also the fact that it's also built in for two bedroom units so we've yeah. got that desire within the Noosa Plan 2020 that our business centres have a residential component so we start building life into all our little business centres and large business centres and uh, 
in, in what I hope is a good trend that is um, economically viable into the future. One would have thought that's where it started in uh, in you know country towns having a shop with living above it. Mm. Mm. Now, Councillor Kippen, this is coming back Thursday night. There's an opportunity for more questions and discussion. Then we're uh, you're happy to um, move this recommend motion and move on to the yeah. agenda. We have yeah. a seconder, please. He, he was suggesting that I would. Councillor Kinsella, uh, all in favour? It's carried. Uh, we'll Thank you. Thank you. Thank Welcome back. Um, we're now up to item two on the agenda, which is the development application for a material change of use for an extension to a shop hire and storage building at Jetty 256 Kimpy Terrace, Mooseville. This has been referred from page 29 of the Planning and Environment Committee meeting agenda. Councillors, any questions for staff? Councillor Joe. Figure six on page 34. 2018, 19, and 20. The uh, the reach of the jetty doesn't appear to have uh, changed, but uh, I'm trying to clarify uh, some of the comments within the uh, the report, but also the drawings as to whether boats that tie up at the end of that jetty are or are not fitting within the lease area. Uh, there's there's because um... 19, 19 it sort of says half the boats are, and 20 says none of the boats are. Yeah, it seems to be the same footprint as far as the mm. the jetty goes. There's 2.4 metres from the um, the head of the jetty to the outside of the lease area. Uh, so and those boats would typically be within the lease area. Yes, that's right. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. That doesn't appear to show that in those drawings. So yeah, there's there's a note in the report that notes that the the cadaster and the aerials don't line up um, exactly. Um, yep. Here's clarification of the question, it's fine. Kerry, oh. Sorry. Um, Kerry, if the enclosure was to be approved, would the extra GFA, which is 11.4 square metres, attract car parking infrastructure fees? And if so, how much? Uh, yes, so the car, car parking rate for a shop is one space per 20 square metres, so yes, it would attract um, a car space um, and we council has a, a contributions in lieu of on-site car parking so the developer if council was to support this could ask the developer to enter into an infrastructure agreement to pay that contribution and um, from memory i think it's fifteen thousand yeah. dollars per car space for noosable um, but that was a few years ago so it's subject to cpi so would that be done on a pro rata um, basis given that the area proposed to be enclosed is almost half, um, 20 square metres, it's 11.42? It, it's not, it could be, that would be council's decision. Yeah. It's not typically, um, you know, you can't have half a car parking space. Once you sort of get halfway, you, you actually contribute to the full parking space. Um, but that, that would be a decision council could make to pro rata that contribution if they wish to support this. Thanks. Just to clarify, what is the definition of gross Area, yeah, so um, we do have the definition ready uh, for you just to, so I can show councillors. But essentially, gross floor area is about whatever is roofed and is enclosed by walls. Um, so that's the definition there. Um, but yeah, they're, oh. what they're at the moment, there's a roofed area, but it's not enclosed by walls, and they're now looking to enclose that by walls so it becomes gross floor area. So it's currently not considered gross. Gross floor area no. because it's only roofed, it's not enclosed, yeah. so it's one out of two. That's right. So it's site cover because it's mm. roofed, yep. but it's not gross floor area because it has no walls. But, but it's not, not enclosed. Yeah, they're not looking to make it any bigger, are they? They're just looking no, to enclose. No, within what? the roofed, under that roofed yep. area. Yeah. So that's the difference gross floor area versus site cover. Yeah, site cover, imagine if you look from the, from the top view, you know, what's the mm. area of the roof line or the building that's from the area? Gross floor areas if you look at what's enclosed. So buildings on water, so it's built on the jetty, that's GFA refers to 
to that in yeah. country as well. It doesn't yeah. change whether it's on water or it's land. Or it's still gross as long as there's yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Kerry, I went down there yesterday afternoon to have a look, in, in, um, late yesterday afternoon, and it seemed to me they were at, they had at full capacity with all their boats. I mean, some of these pictures show. Um, one of the concerns in here was that an increase in size would potentially increase the business and increase, I guess, the usage of um, the river system and that sort of thing. Is that is that still a concern for you, considering that when I was there, it was at, I mean, I don't think they could fit any other boat or vessel or jet ski there. It was at full capacity. Mm. Um, is, is that a concern? It, it is a concern. And what we're seeing with this business and its history of uh, compliance issue is it's not just operating at full capacity, it's actually operating beyond that. That, you know, boats and kayaks and so forth are being stored outside the lease area. Um, so that is of concern and I think, you know, part of the reason why they're looking for additional storage space um, with this application because they're, you yeah, know, not just operating at capacity, they're outside of that. Um, if I could ask, ask Glenn to um, make available a couple of those photos, it just gives sort of the, the demonstration of that. Um, certainly over the years I've been here, I've received a number of complaints about... Oh, hang on a sec. They're on live screen. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's operating well outside those boundaries. Um, but into the park, you know, I, I've, you know once again, um, Areas outside what appear to be outside the lease um, being used. I know I've had complaints about people, children being chased off the beach as all the the um, the jet skis come in and land on the beach. I've had others um, in terms of just the, the the lack of use. And I suppose the the key thing for me in this argument is um, we set limits. Uh, we've gone through a very extended process with the community and, and so it sounds like you're going into the oh, comment good, good point, yes yeah. I am. Yeah. So I suppose that yeah. well, the, these photos just, demonstrate to me what the Well was there a yeah. question there was just I did, yes. Can you show the photos? Sorry, any question we we are here not to be we yeah, have another question. Or, um, okay. um, yeah. When I went down there, I was asking about the infringement notices, um, and the um, reply was that in the infringement, and I think we all received this information that in 2019, the three infringements within four days were because the owner was under the belief that under DERM, they were allowed to do one thing, but then council had changed its policy, and they weren't aware of that, and that's why they got the infringement notices. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, I can't speak to what the owner no. believes, but yeah. certainly the lease has a condition on, on the lease that says yeah. all commercial operations have to be within the lease area. So that the lease is with Durham. It's, yeah. a, it's a state lease, yeah. uh, so it's not just council requirement. Yeah. And, and certainly in recent times, there's been joint audits with the state and with council officers asking these businesses to ensure all their activities are located within the lease and not outside. Um, and look, this this is one business of you know, uh, you know we've listed a number of non compliances yeah but no. this is one business that officers regularly see operating outside its lease. Has Very there been any complaint any any infringements since January nineteen, Kerry? I'd have to look into that one, yeah. okay. Councillor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor. Um, yeah, I was interested to read. We uh, actually received uh, an email from uh, uh, the operator of uh, the business with regard to the reasons behind um, uh, asking for more, a part of the reasoning uh, is associated around COVID and the need for uh, uh, cleaning and additional life jackets and, uh, and sanitising and having room to uh, hang these out to dry. Um, if the areas weren't to be fully enclosed or were enclosed in some sort of a, um, a cage type material, i.e. Like cyclone fence and what the like, um, to at least an hour secure and safe storage and drying facilitation. Would that constitute gross floor area if it was more of a, uh, a, a temporary fencing nature, mm. uh, at least for compliance with COVID? Uh, is that yeah. a compromise that might, might be able to be achieved? Um, well, Council's been supporting many businesses with temporary measures. So I, I, I see no reason why they couldn't have a rack 
that they wheel out of the building each day potentially with their life jackets hanging on that. So that would certainly be an option. Well, an element of security, them. if life jackets are just out there in the open, perhaps that they, uh, they, they may be removed. I'm thinking from a security yeah. perspective. I mean, if it was, if it was, if it was ca caged as opposed to enclosed, mm -hmm. would that be a difference in the application? We, we can certainly talk, talk to them about, um, I think we need to separate what's potentially permanent and what is temporary. That's, 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 what, I'm trying because, to, that's what I'm trying to achieve in my yeah. head and whether that's uh, something yeah. to, to speak so to. So temporary things shouldn't be given a development approval. That's something we can have a separate discussion with about some arrangements for them to cope during this period and what they need during this time to operate. Um, I, I have to be careful about putting and enshrining in a development approval a cage. I think that could look quite ordinary on, on the riverfront, um, but certainly we could talk to them about temporary measures but do that outside the development application process. I'm just wondering if security was an issue, whether yeah. that would be, yeah. that would come into me. Thank you. Yeah. So just to that, I mean, the development application process is a, is a permanent approval. No, I agree. I understand that. I understand that. I'm trying to, trying to see whether a development application is necessary if some other alternative could be yeah. sought or whether something of that structure would need a development application. And the answer is if there were temporary measures, perhaps not. And it might be something that could I be incorporated if it, uh, if it had the, uh, uh, the correct type of appearance. Yeah, uh, on the, on we can certainly talk to them about temporary measures outside the development. I'm going to be talking to them this afternoon. It's yeah. something I wanted to have in my head. Could I ask a, a question? Um, did the, the applicant come to seek campaign advice either over the counter or through a pre lodgement meeting where it would have been laid out pretty clearly that under the Noosa Planning Scheme Waterways Works Code that it, no increase in gross floor area is permitted on these leases? Mm. No, there was no. Did he come and no. that advice before no. the application was lodged? There was no pre lodgement meeting. So, no first advice. thing you were aware of, this application That's right. In. Just to further what um, Joe's talking about, which is looking at solutions um, under COVID response support, and Anthony, maybe a question to you. Would um, outdoor roll up weatherproof blinds in that front area? Would that be something that council would entertain as a temporary measure to accommodate the applicant who is requesting more office space? Um, is that a consideration or would that not be consistent with the Noosa look and feel design um, principles that you alluded to with the cage, yeah. um, Kerry? Look, I, I think we can be open to talking about a range of options that might be temporary for him. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what his, his needs are and he's probably best placed to, mm. to talk to us about what he needs on a temporary basis, um, yeah, okay. but whether it's blinds okay. or, yeah. So I suppose one of the other contributing considerations is where we got to in terms of the Nooseville Foreshore Master Plan and it might be good for Dennis just to outline whether, um, you know, what the, you know, there was a lot of consultation with the community, one of the biggest sort of participation rates we had, uh, you know, is, I suppose the question is, is the feedback we got and the settings in the Nooseville Foreshore Master Plan consistent with the view of planning staff that we should be limiting the growth of commercial use on the foreshore? Dennis, come up with it. Thanks, Dennis. That'd be great. Yeah, so the Nooseville Foreshore Plan is completed um, in May 2018. And um, its focus wasn't on the built form per se of, of the um, jetties and the, the boat sheds, but it did look at the encroachment of commercial uses onto the foreshore. So one of the key um, principles of the foreshore master plan was that commercial encroachment didn't occur beyond the lease boundaries. So um, that, that was certainly enshrined in the plan and, and carried through into the planning scheme. And just to be clear, the applicant is not asking for an increase in the lease area. Correct. Yeah. Any questions for Dennis about the Nooseville Foreshore Plan? Yeah, I will. So the, under the Noosa Foreshore Plan, Dennis, um, land use criteria permits a single kiosk for all the commercial leases where um, it's okay for a small scale ancillary type use, whether it's a shop or even a coffee shop is allowed. So is that contrary or does it contradict the outcome of what we, we refer to as like a, a um, accumulated impact on 
um, activities along the Noosa River. I, I'm, I'm thinking, is there a contradiction in one in one instance? We're saying it's okay to have a ten square meter um, coffee shop or shop with, that sits ten people, and then in another breath, we're saying that um, under the Noosa River Plan as well, and under the Noosa Foreshore Plan, we're saying that we've got to um, limit commercial activity. Uh, it, it was a hot topic at the time of embarking on the foreshore master plan. Mm -hmm. um, the coffee use had sort of been introduced and continued to grow between the various commercial leases and it was sort of one up and shipping away of, of these businesses were getting larger and larger and also um, spilling out onto the foreshore. So um, the foreshore plan sought to sort of broker out an acceptable outcome for the community in relation to the scale of those coffee businesses um, and that fed directly into the, the new planning scheme. But it was all about using existing space, not creating additional space. Mm. So yeah. it was just about if you wanted to convert part of your existing storage area to sell a few coffees, then the foreshore management plan was supportive of that. It wasn't saying you can then now have an additional 10 square metres had to be within that existing within the lease of the lease of the Could I ask, sorry, I'm going to finish. Yes, thank you. Could I ask um, what would be the staff's opinion if there was a C attached to this recommendation that read something along the lines with staff to meet with the applicant uh, to discuss temporary alternative solutions to storage due to COVID restriction requirements? Uh, yeah, that would be appropriate. Yep. Um, are you moving that? Are you moving that well, I will when the council's finished. Well, I will move that. Yeah. Oh, so we just get the word. Okay, so, so it's a, uh, request staff to meet with the applicant to discuss temporary alternative solutions to storage issues due to the COVID restriction requirements. Right. And I would add and um, assisting well. in providing COVID safe environment for his staff mm. um, and employees. Mm. So there's two issues here, storage and office space. Um, so and storage, social distancing. Yeah. Yeah. Social yeah. distancing. Yeah. 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 Storage, storage and, and staff issues. And staff, 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 and staff, yeah. staff yeah. issues. Or, yeah. Yeah. Staff, staff working just conditions. Just storage, Kylie, in the second line there. And staffing. And staff safety issues. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Because mm. that's a big part. Yeah. Would it be better to, rather than restricting quite health directive requirements or something like that? Okay. Yeah. So, I'm happy with well, that's, that's sufficient what you've got now. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. 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 Can we have a second? Oh, seconded. seconded by Brian. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. uh, Councillors, I, I think we're all, uh, we sympathise with what the applicant is trying to achieve. He, he's mm. grappling mm. with some storage issues uh, according to his email due to the COVID restrictions which require more um, life jackets which need to be cleaned in between uses, so he's almost doubled his number of life jackets and also there are social distancing requirements which make space at a premium within the existing gross floor area, uh, but perhaps he does not need to enclose the space uh, to achieve that solution and um, I thought it's, I think it's best to start going and meet with him to um, find the solutions as, as contained in um, section C. There. Can Question. Can I clarify? I'm assuming with an MCU, with a, uh, an application being in here, that the, the applicant has lodged the fees and, and all that associated with a, a development application. That's right. The, the, council, uh, the council's spent time and effort yeah. <laughs> assessing that. Mm. Yeah, I'm just wondering why that wasn't. Uh, was uh, I'm assuming there was no pre-lodgement meeting. That there was yes. no pre-lodgement discussion. That was no. before that was there was no pre-lodgement. Yeah, there was no pre-lodgement and also um, the issue of COVID and the need for this storage really wasn't raised with in the application. Um, it was all about just needing additional storage space. So the, the reason given around COVID has just come to light now. Oh, I guess I'll ask um, you, uh, our uh, economic team manager, um, was the <laughs> issue of a COVID safe working environment or storage needs raised by the applicant before they put in a development application? Not that I'm aware of. It's a 
shame that a conversation wasn't had mm. earlier. Maybe it might have prevented the, uh, the cost of uh, and time associated with it. Okay. I'll speak to the motion yes, to you. Right. Look, I agree with um, Councillor Wilkie's um, amendment. Um, I uh, went down and saw the, the space yesterday. It's very small. Um, they are concerned about the COVID restrictions. There are 12 staff employed. Um, recently, in the last few years, Australian Maritime Safety Authority, as AM, AMSA, uh, increased the, necessary, the necessity for every person hiring a boat to have a life jacket. That wasn't the case a few years prior to, which has increased the use of life jackets. It's also increased the number of life jackets. <laughs> there is now the COVID requirements of having to clean them. Um, and this isn't just, a, people aren't just taking boats out for a whole day, they're taking them out for a couple of hours. So the turnover is creating a lot more, um, you know, a lot, a lot more life jackets coming in and, and needing space for them. Um, they've also um, flagged the idea that there are, or flagged the notion that there were long queues with people waiting because the space is small. Um, the social distancing requirements are hard to adhere to. The space is very small and at times they can have a number of people working in the shop or waiting. So I think this, look, none of us want to see overuse of the river. We're all very much, um, you know, on the same page when it comes to restricting the commercial usage of the river and maintaining it for our residents. Um, so, but I think this is a really good motion. I think this is this is something that you know shows that we're willing to work with the applicant, and so I, I support it wholeheartedly. Councillor Morrison, um, I'll speak to this one. Um, this has been a difficult decision for me. Um, the applicant, UGD, has requested what I consider a minor extension to shop hire and storage building. Um, the area is minor. It's 7.6 metres for a bigger office and shop and 3.8 square metres at the back of the shop that's going to be used for storage. Um, again, what he's requesting is minor and his reasons are actually valid. Increased regulation has meant increased light, um, increases in life jacket numbers and safety equipment. And COVID has meant that staff are to work in a COVID safe environment. The extra space achieves both objectives. Um, we've got a local economic um, development plan that's aimed in supporting existing businesses that contribute to our economy. And here we have a business that does just that. This is a 14 year old business that employs 12 staff mm. and have come to us for support. But, and I say but, but allowing it to expand and operate from outside the existing lease area onto public land is not how we do this. And more importantly, it does not support other existing businesses who follow the rules. If we approve this application, we do undermine the Noosa plan and make a mockery of the Noosaville foreshore plan and Noosa river plan, which make clear that the foreshore is a public space. The Noosaville foreshore plan states that commercial businesses along the foreshore do not encroach onto public land and remain wholly within commercial jetty leases or freehold lot boundaries. Public lands must be preserved for the benefit of the community and generations um, in the future. These lands are, quote, fundamental to our social, economic and environmental well-being and must be protected. If we approve this application, we put at risk all public land, our beaches, our parks and our waterways. So, councillors, I'm not prepared to do this and I support council's recommendation to refuse the application and, and support Council Wilkie's recommendation that the applicant um, reaches out to council um, to look at alternate solutions for storage and providing COVID safe working environment for his staff. Councillor Jones. Um, question for staff. If uh, this application were to be approved, can the uses on those extended areas be restricted to point of light storage? Is there any way that um, the purpose of the room can be um, um, conditioned? Um, yes, Council can. Uh, I think we need to be a little bit mindful though that the Noosa plan does allow you know, those spaces to be converted without a development application for food and drink outlets. Um, that, was my next, that was the next part yeah. of the question. Yeah. So yes, we could, we could convert them, but there's no, we could uh, condition them, but there's no guarantee that that use yeah, would, I think the because there'd be no requirement for a, a further application to change the use of that. Yeah. Is yeah. that correct? That's right. Thank you. 
One. Councillor Tom. I, I don't believe there's ever been a time, well, not within the last, my lifetime, that you could rent a boat from any of those places without a life jacket. I don't think, I don't think the regulations would have changed concerning having to have more life jackets on the premise now than before, because historically, whenever you rent anything, a kayak, any sort of <clears throat> boat, you have to have a life jacket. So just something, just a fact to check up on, where um, you might want to ask that if that's actually the case, because it's been rolled around a couple of times here that all of a sudden there's new regulations because they have to have more life jackets, right? I doubt that. Just to clarify, the, just, just to clarify the, the email we received this morning, it suggested that he needs more life jackets because he needs to clean some while others are in, in use yeah. due to COVID requirements. Is that yeah. not saying he hasn't required them before, he just needs more now? Is that that, that's my reading of the email that Council has received. I this also got some information saying in 2017, I think the Maritime Safety um, Act um, actually stipulated that. Um, there, there was this increased requirements and I actually had a look and did some research on it and once upon a time I think that um, if you had a vessel um, you actually didn't need life jackets if they, there's a word neutral buoyancy that they refer to so um, 2017 2016 2017 there were actual changes um, that did um, Re, re, not request to require that um, all high vessel operators increase the number of life jackets, so it became one per person instead of no, no, none, um, none per boat. Um, and also safety equipment, um, so there was also an increase in safety equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so Tom, does that answer your question? Australian Maritime Safety Authority, I think it was under. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, no, that, that's very, that's new news to me. Yeah, that's very interesting. I wanted to bring it up because it was in the back okay. of my mind. Maybe yeah. between state and Australian legislation as well, because there would have been state legislation around like, So we'll um, take, yeah, this. Yeah, we'll take that as a question, Tom. Do you yeah. want to speak to the motion at all? No. No, okay. Um, Councillor Stockwell. Uh, yes, so understand, I, I think uh, the inclusion of C is a, a a good indication of preparedness to address um, the emergent needs of this business. Um, I think the planning case and the planning principle is is what at stake. Um, uh, uh, Councillor um, Lawrence mentioned a, a business 14 years, and maybe the current owners have had it for 14 years. But I first time I ever sailed a Hobie Cat was from this establishment in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and back then it employed one person who slept most of the day. Um, so it, <laughs> it's uh, much smaller. Um, Enterprise that when the lease was actually offered, um, and and obviously the, the benefit to the economy is now it's employing more people, but at, at the same time, uh, the history of compliance on this site has been the most significant of any business. Um, and now that some mention has been made about it's only a small increase, so councillors, the existing building is only eighteen point three metres squared. If approved, this would be a hundred and sixty two percent increase in the gross floor area. Point. 62% increase over the existing. So the it is a significant increase, which would be able to be used mm. to significantly increase the commercial activity. We've heard that the is a, there's an ability, once it is approved, to convert it into part of that, um, you know, to other commercial uses under the, under the NIST Plan 2020. So to me, the principle is, as it should be, that we in Noosa are based all our tourism to be based on the carrying capacity and the capacity on the river is within what is there now. And I think, you know, operating the business within the lease area, uh, we wish them all the success they can have. But I think this principle of not increasing gross floor area and commercial use on the Noosa River is a very important one. So and that's why I agree with the recommendation. <laughs> Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Um, I think it's all been said. Uh, just uh, in, in closing, I'll just say uh, I think it would be fair to say uh, that the applicant has um, uh, had challenges in containing the um, commercial uses within the lease area. But uh, just to clarify, he's not seeking an increase in the lease area as part of this application, but it does involve an application for an increase in gross floor area, which is contrary to the NUSA planning scheme, which contains the aspirations of the community that commercial development does not 
increase on the litter. And um, I look forward to hearing back from staff about um, what solutions you have to, to arrive at um, in negotiation and discussion with the applicant. But the motion those in favour. Uh, that's unanimous. Um, thank you, Ms. Kerry. Thank, thank you, Ms. Kerry. Thank you for that. We go to the next uh, item three is the debt refinancing investigation. It came direct from the Services and Organisation Committee meeting due to the significance of the issue. Welcome, Michael. Is there any uh, questions, please? Um, Michael, I asked this question in the earlier meeting, um, but I'll do it again now, maybe more for the people at home and perhaps some of the councillors who weren't at that meeting. Um, on page eight, um, of the Services and Organisation Committee agenda. Uh, the new initiative announced by the Queensland Government allows the early repayment adjustment to be funded either by cash and or debt or a combination of the two, where previously an ERA had to be paid for by cash. Can you just explain this again to us? Sure. The, um, so basically this isn't too dissimilar to um, a, a normal a normal person looking at refinancing their debt, the banks, you know, generally like to, you know, they have to borrow funds from various sources, and if there is a, a request to refinance, then there's usually cost involved with that, and, and that's no different here. Um, previously, the government and Queensland Treasury, um, if councils wanted to refinance their debt, they had to um, any adjustment associated with that debt or an early payment adjust, adjustment or a um, a, a fee that had to be um, paid up front. Where given COVID and the cash flow pressures on local government at the moment, um, this initiative allows that to be effectively capitalised as part of the refinancing and then paid off over over the life of a, a new loan term. So, right. great, thank you. So, what the two options? Um, I notice we've chosen the. Uh, the second option to recapitalise. Um, why was that option chosen as opposed to using cash? To... <laughs> Good Bit of a dog here, but I know the answer. It's in yeah. The... Um, look, the reality is, if if you look over a twenty year life of of a refinancing of refinancing our debt, there is technically no net benefit in terms of interest savings because over twenty years the interest from a 1.7% loan to a net five, average five is the same because the loan term's increasing, so you're paying interest for longer. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? It's all about the current uncertainty in the global and local environments in terms of the economy. So, you know, and we want, we've just gone through a really difficult budget, you know, a lot of, lot of uncertainty, a lot of cash flow modelling from Trent, and, and through finance to make sure that we are sustainable in the short term. This exercise is to actually, you know, contribute towards that. So actually, you know, free up some cash in the short term mm -hmm. over the next five years, which will then, you know, council still needs to do things. So it's using that cash potentially either as a buffer if there is any um, economic challenges we face in the next few years or potentially for investment. We need to invest in the local economy, which we have been doing. If we want to continue that investment approach, then we are freeing up cash to do that. So, um, the thing to note probably wasn't made clear in my report was, you know, there's a three million dollar mm -hmm. cost here. However, which will be passed on to ratepayers post year ten. So years ten to twenty is a th effectively three million dollars more of loans that have to be repaid. However. Um, in our view, the short-term benefits mm. outweigh the longer-term cost. That's no. why we're recommending to do that. And I might just ask Michael a sort of follow-up question in relation to, you know, in 10 years' time, if interest rates are at 5% and the council's got spare cash, we could pay off that outstanding balance earlier if we wanted to, the 1.7 sure. and, and Definitely. The, so flip the other way. It's, it's all forecasting, as, yeah. as councillors mm. know, things change. However, based on our current model, the numbers are the numbers. Um, but it's, in, in our view, this is a prudent, again, part of our prudent financial management mm -hmm. of, of the shire, which, which we've been doing for the last five years. Having said that, Mr. CEO, any early payment doesn't come without cost, and there's still a cost associated with 
with an early payment as a because the, uh, the the borrower of course would expect the uh, the full amount of their uh, their interest over time, so there is still a cost associated with an early payment. Yeah, at the moment though, it's the, most of that payment might be grouped from wrong is on the basis that we're coming from a higher interest rate to a lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. We're going the other way. There yep. might be a benefit yep. in mm -hmm. future time. Mm -hmm. Just clarify that. On page thirteen, Michael, um, total cash on hand at the end of November was sixty five million dollars. Um, as you just alluded, we've got strong cash reserve. Um, how does that compare with our neighbouring councils? Uh, no you. idea. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> oh, sorry. Um, you're looking oh, for a report. It's services and organisation. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Back to the blue board. The blue yeah, board. Yeah, blue sorry. Page one. But we want to go there too. That's a great. Sorry, that, that <laughs> is. <laughs> no, I'm just. Not. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, Michael. Um, yeah, the, I suppose the for once again the the benefit of short term cash reserves versus say uh, uh, loaning at the current is that cash reserves can be used for any use. Whereas if we we didn't do this and we needed to loan money uh, in future years, we'd be restricted to capital items. Is that the one of the key considerations? Correct. Yeah. And I wish I could borrow at one point seven million. <laughs> so do we all. I wish I had sixty-five million dollar cash. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to clarify something in the figures, if I may. The, the, the chart on table two says the total reduced annual repayment and in the report by either the ERA funded by debt or funded by cash is two point four million dollars annually. Over a 20 year loan, that's $40 million in a reduction of a $23 million debt. Is that right? No, the, the repayment is just one component of a, um, of a loan. So you've got the interest component as well. So this interest. Okay, so that's okay. so total. Not the interest, that's the actual, so that's yes. actually paying off the debt. Correct. So that's the debt and, and interest would accumulate. Uh, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I understand the figure now, sorry. Michael, the amount of debt inherited at D amalgamation is about 40 million, is that correct? Yeah. And the table on page nine mentions the amalgamation transfer debt of 16 million. The rest has been this recent loan, loans that we've taken off. Correct. Yeah. So it's basically effectively halved our debt. Yes. We have since 2014. Yes. Yeah. And maybe just to benefit the new council, if that deamalgamation bed is not what it cost to do the deamalgamation, what that was was that Sunshine Coast had a, a, had a debt, mm -hmm. and we apportioned roughly 20%, Michael, if you remember, 2021, thereabouts, yeah. of that debt was then apportioned to Noosa because that a lot of money had been incurred during the amalgamation year. So it was a fair allocation of that debt that we then inherited part of Sunshine Coast Council debt. So that wasn't the cost of doing the deamalgamation. That was just a bit like to split the bank account and get a divorce and split the debt. Mm. Similar sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. So they, got, at the they got the house and we got the, the second hand. So Brent, at the time um, when that was all happening, there was a lot of concern that council didn't have the capacity to repay that debt. Um, this is evidence um, that we do um, on page 14, we're on track, yeah? Absolutely. In fact, we made the extra one last year. It's 10 million yet last year, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, we've got, you know, the, we've had two reviews by Queensland Treasury over the last six years, and, and you know, we, we're in a sound financial position and got good capacity to, mm. to continue to continue that way. So it's, um, I think we're in a good spot. Mm. Thanks, Michael. Councillors, uh, anyone care to move that? Uh, I'll move it. Move Councillor Stewart, seconded Councillor Wegener. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, you should speak to her. No, I, I just, I mean, I think this is this is very self explanatory. I think that, you know, thank you for your hard work, Michael, and, and you know, Queensland Treasury Corporation clearly indicates, um, you know, or understands, you know, the pressures of COVID and on small councils. So I think the refinance at the 1.7%. As Brett said, I think anyone in Australia would love that interest rate, so I think it's a great thing. Um, and, and thank you, these numbers are very sound, so thank you to you and Trent and all the team mm, for your hard you. work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other councillors speak? Uh, Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, I'd just, just like to highlight how 
created this to be in local government where one minute you're discussing an 11 square metre storage area and the next it's a refinancing of $23 million. <laughs> yeah. Never done one. And right. one takes an hour and the other one takes five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for your thank you. investigation and hard work on this. It's very, it is a very prudent decision to take, make use of very low interest rates, 1.7, refinancing the debt at 1.7 as opposed to 5.4%. Uh, makes good sense. It will free up cash when we need it over the next five years. I guess the, the discipline for councillors is not to, to spend it just because it's there, but it does give us that capacity to absorb any shocks that may be coming our, our way. And the next budget, you said, will be a very tough one already. Um, mm. so, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I wish to claim no, I won't. Oh, we'll we'll those in favour? That's unanimous. Okay, we're, we're now, uh, the next item is. Uh, Item four, which is uh, tourism use oh, exemption okay. request <coughs> for the provision of alcohol for temporary events during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Stuart? Um, I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as I'm a board director of Young Care, who are the beneficiary of the funds raised from the Young Care Long Lunch event for which Tourism Noosa are applying for an exemption request. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will leave the room while this matter has been considered and voted on. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Thank you. You're on the Board of Tourism, do you say? Oh. And that's um, yeah, exactly. the Board of Tourism. Oh, an observer. They're an observer. No, okay. Just making sure. That's an exemption. Yeah. 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 There's a provision that you've been appointed by council. Just, just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, just not. <laughs> Thank you. No, good. Okay. <laughs> Please do. Um, uh, hello, Jill. Hello, Good to see you. Hello, Clint. Hello, Frank. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, do we have any questions for staff uh, councillors? Yeah. Um, clarification. I know what a high tea is, and I know what a soiree is, but what's a high tea soiree that's got licence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a hybrid. Drinking Long Island nice tea. I think they probably have champagne and orange juice with it as well as, as, well as having tea. <laughs> that's fine. So to clarify, would it be fair to characterise this this motion if we, when we pass it as a giving in principle support for these these applications to be lodged these applications for temporary event permits involving alcohol to be lodged and assessed it's not approval at this point but the it's in principle approval for these applications to be lodged and then they'll be assessed that's right yeah yeah, yeah. look they it's it's two parts to it. This is considering a, an exemption for the provision of alcohol. Council needs to or considers that exemption. Yeah. And then the assessment of the actual event is a separate process. Yeah. And can I ask, what was it about the, um, the material you received so far that reassured you that an exemption was the appropriate way to go? Um, well, with regards to, through you, Mr Chair, with regards to our um, the items on page five there? Yeah, yeah. the yeah. items on page five, and considering the previous report to council as well in August, um, they've, they've submitted all of, all of the details required. It's been considered by the, the reference group. Um, so it's addressed criteria there and satisfactorily addressed those criteria. So the reference group was happy for this um, <coughs> exemption to come to council. Mm. Clint, can I ask, um, what's the processing time frame? How long does an application like this take from start to finish? Through you, Mr Chair. Councillor, that is very much in the hands of the applicant to a large extent. Um, the quicker that we get information in to help us begin an assessment, the quicker the turnaround can be. So uh, it can be... Um, a matter of weeks. We have to do a stake. So when we, as we receive information in, we then go to stakeholders, our internal stakeholders, because they involve road closures and, and other various um, components that need to be discussed within council. Um, some event organisers uh, submit all that information all at once. So we're in a very good position to be able to begin an assessment quite early on. Others tend to uh, uh, dribble it in, if I can put it that way, and which, which makes the assessment um, a longer process. So to, to, to answer the question, generally speaking, 
uh, it's the quicker they get the information in for us to assess, the better. It's hard to give you a precise answer, but it's a, merely, it can be a couple of weeks. Once we've gone through the stakeholder assessment, um, it can be very quick. So a couple of weeks, so that's, um, that, that's my next question. So if they wanted to fast track it, um, they've got that opportunity to accelerate that process. I, 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 is there? Uh, well, through Mr Chair, Councillor, they're fast tracking it now because we're receiving the information. So okay. as of last week, so the information is back on them. The, yeah. only, the information is now flowing in. Yeah. So Jill is in a very good position now to be able to do an assessment, uh, the, and the information has gone out to stakeholders. That has happened. So uh, depending on what those stakeholders say, um, we should be in a pretty good position to turn it around quickly. So that, as of last week, information flowing in, so I'm, I'm more confident now in giving a, a quick turnaround. Okay. Um, Councillor Joe, and then Councillor Brian. Whilst this is the first um, uh, application for an event outside of the, uh, the current restrictions that we've got uh, being brought to Council, is this the first uh, application or, uh, or a, um, a request for an event that you've uh, received? To, to be either having serving alcohol under 500 people or in excess of 500 people? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, this is the first one the reference group um, has considered to take forward. Uh, there has been other... With alcohol. With alcohol. Uh, there's been plenty of other events um, that we've approved without alcohol under the current restrictions that Not we have. question I ask you. Within, within the restrictions, have there been other applications or approaches to serve alcohol in events under 500 or to have more than 500 people in an event until the restrictions are lifted as proposed to be reviewed in February? Well, this is, this is the first one with alcohol that we've considered. Okay, that's all I ask. Thank you. And I suppose just to clarify, the when we put the requirement in the policy we said about no alcohol, it was with concern that um, events in public space, uh, <clears throat> bars open to the public, lack of social distance, high likelihood of, of social distancing areas being compromised, people after a few drinks more likely to, to um, shake hands. And this one is ticketed, seated and restricted to public access. So all those things, all those concerns about what the alcohol consumption might lead to have been managed in this environment, environment and therefore why the, why the exemption's been suggested. So. Yeah, through you, Mr Chair, that's correct. And we refer back to the criteria, there's a number of criteria in there, um, current health advice from the state. So when the reference group, and it meets monthly, um, and it considers all of those um, criteria that, that are listed. So. Um, current health advice from the state is, is an important one as well. So what's the, what's the environment looking like in terms of um, infections and, and whatever else. But um, as we say in the report, overall we think that this um, event uh, presents fairly low risk. I'm happy to move. Move, Councillor Stockwell. I have a second, Councillor Jerusalem. Brian? Oh, I think I think the the rationale for providing this exemption is quite clear. Uh, it's, um, you know, our, our policy at the moment is you know putting a strong priority on public health, and these two events uh, I think have managed that to a point where the risk is minimised to an acceptable level. I think it's a, a good recommendation from staff. Thank you. Any councillors wish to speak to the motion? Put the motion in favour. That's unanimous. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Next item is um, the financial performance report for November. That's on page five of the general committee meeting agenda. We have Clint and Michael here, manager of financial services and director of corporate services, Michael. Uh, 
questions? Um, I really, I've already is, asked my question. <laughs> 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 you only get one chance. <laughs> um, I've got to, yeah, in regards to our cash reserves, um, page 13 of the report, Trent, um, notes that total cash on hand at the end of November was $65 million. And my question is, um, that seems very healthy, and how does it compare with other councils? Um, I think I'd start by saying it's, it's not always easy to just take the dollar value at a, at a snapshot point in time in our cash balance and simply compare that to your neighbour and come to either side to go, is that a, is that a healthy balance? Um, there's a couple of considerations. One is obviously, as you can see by the, the graphs in the report, Black the balance rates. does fluctuate quite significantly yeah. between between rating cycles. So we're midway through at the moment. Okay. So it will drop lower between now and January as we continue to chew through that cash, so to speak, in, on operating and capital expenditure. Um, but I, I just wanted to, I suppose, the best thing is to point out the some of the key performance indicators that are on page 15 of the report where we talk about cash cover and net financial liabilities ratio. And I think that's the key when we're doing comparison in terms of what is a healthy cash balance mm -hmm. for different councils to have. Um, and the cash cover is, is the key for us is that we want to be above that three months cash cover ratio. It's about making sure that we've got enough cash at any one point in time to continue to operate between three to six months if no other income were to come through the door. Mm. So for us, as you can see, we're quite high, we're well above the the, um, the benchmarks there, which is quite healthy. Um, just for the people at home, Trent, we're over three times the benchmark. 10.7 10. 10. months. months versus mm. three Correct. months. Correct. So we're very healthy there. That's right. Yeah. So even after, obviously, um, investment decisions last year to, to repay $10 million worth of debt early, and also, obviously, to allow for any uncertainty during this year in terms of COVID and how that will impact the operations of some of our larger revenue earning business activities such as waste management and, and community facilities and the holiday parks. We've still got quite a conservative um, cash buffer yep. to cover us for those mm -hmm. uncertain events or to reinvest into the community. So we are in a very good position from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Trent, I've got a question. On page eight, um, our, if we look at operating revenue, uh, where compared budget compared to actual, we're 2.1 million, 2.8 million, sorry, more. Is that because our um, parks have been opened sooner than rather than predicted? Primarily, it's due to the holiday parks yep. and the community facilities, okay. um, such as the NAC and the leisure centre. That yep. um, when we did the budget for this year, we obviously forecast that they would be closed for a period of yep. time and then, and then slowly ramping up again. But fortunately, so far this year, that hasn't been the case. Um, they've been open the whole time, so mm. it's it's primarily due to those those facilities being open. And our expenditures down by five hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. Correct. What's that mainly due to? There is obviously an element of it that, that's employee costs. So yep. we've got some vacancies and positions and delays in recruitment for some positions during the year. Yeah. Now obviously there's been some, some offsetting backfill for casuals and overtime to cover some of that cost. Yeah. But that, that obviously doesn't completely absorb the saving we've had from some of those vacancies. Yeah. And the rest at this point in time is in relation to materials and services. So for some of our business activities such as works ops, parks and landscapes, etc. Um, timing of their expenditure is scheduled yeah. to occur later in the year. Mm -hmm. For example, um, parks and landscape with arborist and, and maintenance and um, mowing works. I'm sure after our <laughs> weekend of weather, um, yeah. we may see it, we may even see a spike in that next month coming through. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's also a spike again in legal costs um, mm -hmm. and I've spoken to Brett about it and quite excited to um, to be told that we're undertaking a review um, of our governance branch um, and we're considering looking at in-house um, councils. Yeah, just maybe explain for the rest of the council. So we've, um, our governance branch, managed by guys, got a lot of sort of competing interests at the moment and our expect team had a look at that three, four weeks ago, would have been roughly. Um, and we're doing a review of that area to have a look at what's the right mix, how the functions work, and included in that is a look at 
the legal services, whether they're better off having an in-house lawyer or not, or what that what that might look like. So. Well, that that be only lawyers didn't charge so much. So that would be a <laughs> lawyer, Brett. What, will that be a general? Well, that's what the review would look at. My gut feeling is that you wouldn't get a specialist planning lawyer in because mm. it's too specialist, mm. um, and that's where most of our expenditure is. You're probably better off with a, a generalist type lawyer to cover a lot of the other issues, but also then manage that that type of issue as well. So in-house counsel. Yeah, and that's what most other larger councils do. They tend yeah. to have some, some generalists in there. Um, we're in that sort of mid-range, so it's bit, mm. whether we should have one or not. That's what that review's going to look at. Can you speak? Brian, does he go? Um, so a range of indicators is really good, but the, the one that's always is probably a, a lead indicator of economic recovery or futures is your fees and charges. And so I see that, you know, building, plumbing and development applications are all above predicted. Um, so that suggests that uh, we're getting uh, more applications or larger applications, probably more smaller applications that, that will result in local construction jobs in the coming months. Is that an accurate? Well, that's where all the stimulus went, wasn't it? So it hasn't really stopped. The building hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of a blip back in, I mean, March, April, but it's kicked on. Same, mm -hmm. particularly up here. And you know, we're starting to see it through the surge fees now for property transfers. It's, it's a bit out of control up at the moment in Lisa, mm -hmm. and um, everyone mm -hmm. wants to live here, and um, good luck to them. I'll just confirm that the capital expenditure uh, um, variance of uh, 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 0.1 million. Is the uh, is what we're seeing on in the next part of the report further down in this uh, in the in the next item in this uh, in this report in page 24 of that 110 in uh, 110 in adjustments on page 24 on that page. That's, that's the next. Uh, yeah, it's in the next it's item. The dif they're different items. The, the but that's, that's 110. Is that point one million <coughs> something? Uh, they're they're different items. They are different items. Yeah. Right? So we are we are um, in terms of year to date expenditure we are we are one hundred and ten thousand or point one million under budget for capital works which over thirty five billion dollars is coming through so it's good that it's tracking well um, there's obviously some large capital works program items scheduled in to start construction later in the year so depending on timing of tenders and construction and weather we'll um, we'll see how that schedules out during the, during the year that's ahead of budget not, not behind our that's ahead of budget in that in that table saying oh, we've, we've actually spent more that's that just means we've done more work in the than expected by the end by this point in time. It's, it's, look, it's, it's, you know for every single project the project managers have to do cash flow forecasting mm. so it's that appears to me that we're not exactly ahead of the exact science trying to get the year to date no, no, budget no, exactly matching. Yeah, so that appears to me that we're ahead of schedule, at least on schedule, ahead well, of schedule rather than Potentially, but I think from in the a lot of the projects, um, I think there's a couple of big ones. Rufus Street's one that's probably tracking a little bit behind, but a lot of the COVID related projects are all tracking well in terms of their speeds. Sure. Councillor, the only other one I'd, I'd point out, the government's very at the moment, the rate is, rates and arrears. A bit like what Brian said, in terms of early mm. indicators of what's happening in the economy with development applications of plumbing, building mm. plumbing applications. This is one where we think we're really off track with be getting a loan bill, but we're not. Mm. So people are still paying the bills. Mm. Um, it's interesting. In fact, it's probably a little bit ahead of where we've been previously. Right. That's because their property prices have tripled in the last <laughs> six months. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, it doesn't mean you can still pay your bills. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> but there's confidence, the confidence in the market. Yeah. 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 Uh, Tom, but just with, with, with the building boom that's happening, in general, how does that money from the building out there transfer into the budget of our, our budget? Like, how does it filter in to us? Because most of our money comes from rates and um, sidewalk dining in the holiday parks. But how does that filter in? Through... Oh. Development-wise, it comes through development application fees. So when a developer wants to, to lodge up an application, there's fees that they must pay council to do that assessment. Um, there's building regulation, so our building and plumbing team have um, fees that they charge to do the regulatory aspects of any building works. Um, 
that come through. So whether it be, even, even if they're private certified type works, there's still a regulatory element that has to be assessed and, and that's where you see council charging fees for those type of activities. So, so yeah, so they're probably the two major areas from memory where, where the, um, you know, the development and building um, boom or, or activities flow through in terms of revenue to counselling for fees. And do you feel confident that we have enough people on the ground or in council, you know, um, working with the builders to get those fees and to, to get to get it all happening fast and efficiently? Well, they're not in my area, so I can't <laughs> comment, but I assume so. The um, building and plumbing area is a bit under the pump at the moment. Mm -hmm. They've got a bit of a backlog, but they're working through that. I was talking to our manager there. He thinks he'll have that cleared sort of late January, early February. Is that an acceptable time frame to see that? Yeah, I think so. They, they, you know, they're getting all the urgent ones out and doing what they need to do, but um, it's the sort of thing where you get a quick spike and you've got to, got to get mm -hmm. through it. You can't sort of theory your staffing levels up to this to get one spike and then deal with it and be up here. So what they they get up to what they call this is normal. They've got a spike now and they're just going to clear that over time. So is that a spike that's been there since or, or this year? I know every time we get a report like this, this you know, building and planning and town planning, they're way above uh, above budget in terms of expenses that are being flat out. Mm. Um, so is it, a, is it a spike that's become a plateau? Oh, <laughs> oh look, I think it's, a, it's probably a component of conservative budgeting, which we've always done in terms of making sure that, you know, we generally realise upside in terms of revenue and we don't underestimate our revenues, which then can potentially flow through to underestimating general rate in increases that we may need to, mm. to fund general operations. So we, you know, it may, I think, potentially you've got a combination where you've got you know, conservative budgeting, but we know that it's hot things market. are hot at the yeah. moment. Yeah, it potentially means you can make more conservative uh, in uh, budgeting for a, uh, a surplus when we, you know, they, they, if uh, we've been conservative, the surplus is likely to occur. Councillors wish to move that motion. Move, Councillor Stewart. Seconded, Councillor Finzel. No, again, um, just, you know, thank you, Michael and Trent. This is really sound. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, where sort of the, the budgeting conservatively has worked very well. So, I mean, this is, every time we receive this, it seems that, you know, we're on track. And if not just on track, but, you know, things are ahead. Of, ahead. So that's to good forecasting and good management. So, so thank you very much for that. If I could just, um, going on to that, um, just point out before that cash is king, is something you all the same, Mike? $55 <laughs> million dollars of cash. That mean, and even if um, there are no rates, fees or charges to come in from today, this council could still operate and provide all the services it does for another 10.7 months. It's a very good position <laughs> to be in. Again, it's, it, it doesn't mean that when it comes down to that um, budget time, the three councillors can go crazy and spend it. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Frank. Yes, it does. Can we just remember this moment that we can Frank, <laughs> when did the chairmanship role give you the job of being a killjoy? Just <laughs> <laughs> a question. A question. Hey, Council, speak to the motion. No. no. All in favour? That's carried. And the final item is the Budget Review 2 on page 22 of the General Committee Agenda. I'll ask, I'll ask the board. I'll ask the board. So the key criteria for budget reviews include point one that uh, council must ensure complies with its financial sustainability, sustainability policy targets. Note for 2021 but adopted budget. One indicator will not be met due to COVID 19 impacts. What's the one indicator that we won't meet? Operating surplus ratio. Yeah. So we're still at the uh, wasn't mentioned there, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd reiterate what the one was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, obviously, um, in the table on page 22, the deficit uh, remains and it increases slightly this year. Amelia? Um, my question, uh, page 25. Um, in your opinion, Trent, what are the major risks that you've identified as having the potential to impact on ongoing financial sustainability um, and 
Second question, are you concerned with the investigation with the Queensland Environment Department regarding the burning of the treated timber? Is that one of the risks? I'll answer the second one. I'm going to take the first one. Sure. Um, obviously, as we talked about earlier this afternoon, in terms of conservative budgeting, um, we are in a very healthy position in terms of being able to absorb any future risks or impacts that may or may not occur for the rest of the year um, due to COVID-19. I think that's probably the, the major financial risk for us mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of other operational risks that may impact a meeting budget whether that's um, unexpected expenditure costs that we haven't budgeted for we still have significant capacity so from that perspective very low risk there and concerns for us from the finance perspective um, the only other one to mention would be in terms of debt as you can see mm -hmm. our debt is exceptionally low. The sustainability indicators in the previous report show that we have significant borrowing capacity even after refinancing mm -hmm. to absorb that. So I have no concerns. Yeah, um, and probably just pick up on that one. You know, that's the, the biggest risk in reality is that the second lockdown and we have to shuttle our facilities and lose revenue. That's, that's the bottom line. Mm. Um, to answer your question about the um, Stockpiled. The stockpile at the mm, moment? Yeah. No, I'm not concerned about that. Um, we had a scenario where some of our staff have done the wrong thing in terms of burning off some material which they shouldn't have burned off. Um, we've been working very closely with the Department of Environment and provided them with all the information and got remedy plans and things like that. It's finally a matter for that department, but I'm not expecting a fine out of that uh, at all. Um, but they haven't made that final decision yet. They're quite comfortable. All the feedback we've been given is they're very comfortable with the rectification action plan we've put in place and what we're doing there. And just to ensure there's no other issues, we're doing a review of all of our other storage areas. So that's one of the storage areas at the moment. We're looking at that one. We're looking at Ringtail Creek and the one at Moosa Heads just to make sure we've got the right practices in place. Great. Thank you. Um, just a question with regards to risk mitigations. Um, because we've got going to have an increase of cash surplus, are you confident that we have robust enough accounting systems to make sure that there's no issues moving forward in terms of mismanagement of finance? Okay. I, can, I can answer that question. Um, so generally, we, we have good budget management at the manager level. So they do, do a good job of managing their budgets to the, their actuals to their budget. So, so the financial literacy is pretty good within the organisation. Um, bringing it up though to the higher level is our overarching sustainability policy. So, you know, as a council, we, we agree to that policy before we start any budget process. And I'll be asking councillors to review that policy and do the same. Um, and effectively what that will do, um, Karen, is commit to uh, achieving those ratios. And if we commit to achieving those ratios in the budget or getting close to them as part of our recovery plan through COVID, then there's low risk of us um, um, yeah, being financially mismanaged. So. Are you saying councillors are the risk? <laughs> <laughs> well, the councillors are the decision makers. Mm -hmm. Councillors decide on the big ticket items, the capital budget, the operating budget, and everything really. So, um, but it's up to us to provide that support and education. Yeah. And, and we have that policy information. Like Correct. Which we've all ratified. This and year. I think, you know, again, I think we'll, we'll be in a good space when we, we prepare next year's budget and we'll all be making good decisions and investing funds where, where we think they're needed. So. And just to pick up on that, you know, some councils in other, in other parts of the state have made, the council has actually made decisions that for five years in a row they'll adopt as part of their budget a deficit budget. Mm. And then after five years they go, well, we haven't got enough money to be able to look after our assets or do whatever. And there's some surprise expressed about that, mm. which always amazes me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's no different to your home budget if you're spending more than you're earning, mm. then eventually mm. you're going to run into trouble. So yeah. it's going to run out of money. But we have good systems in place. We've got technology which, you know, helps inform Mm. So we'll all be we'll be using all of those things yeah. to to help inform good decision making in the next six twelve months. And we're subject to audit by the Queensland Audit Office, which mm. is an early audit that process each year. Mm. Well, Martin, um, this budget review process feeds very supports and complements very much the zero based budgeting approach this council has taken since de amalgamation. For the benefit of those listening, can you just expand on what zero based budgeting is and how BR two 
is, uh, is, is sort of like, uh, provides flexibility to that process if any emergent issues arise. Yeah, so zero-based budgeting is probably what it means. It means you, you start off, you build your what you need to deliver your services from zero. So you work out what salaries do we need, what material, what contracts. And, through, and when we build our budget, each, each area council does that. They build it up from, from, from a zero base. It's not just last year's budget plus we'll give you 3%. It's actually based on levels of service and what, what we actually need to deliver those services in terms of employees and, and as I mentioned, uh, materials, contracts and so on. So that, um, that helps us, gives us uh, confidence that, you know, we're, there's no hollow logs, there's no fat building in, in the budgets, which, which happens, that happens, happens in the private sector, happens in the public sector. So we're, um, we're confident we have a fairly efficient cost base and then that helps us look at our revenue levels and, and our general rates and, and what we need to then um, charge to be sustainable, which, um, which, which has worked well for us over the last five years. Michael, we love hollow logs, they provide good environment for uh, our, our native people to <laughs> So what you're uh, saying, kind of figuratively speaking, <laughs> <laughs> so another wood analogy, but there's a, there's no dead weight that's kind of hiding back there. It's probably is a little bit more um, more work to do the zero base every year, but you don't, but you just don't have a, a dead weight accumulating in different places, like you said. So well, we don't, and I think it also helps, particularly a managers manage their budgets because they know then where. If, where things are over and under, and if things go over, that happens, but then there's a mechanism through the budget reviews to address that. Um, yeah, so that's, I think we, um, I think the approach works well, and um, it will also allows us, in terms of finance and corporate services, to report um, variances through the monthly reporting process in terms of where where things are over and under in terms of service delivery. So apparently all state and federal agencies have adopted the same process. Mm. There's a lot of work, but they know where they know where they sit. And, and it, uh, it, uh, yeah, it does put work on our management team. Mm. Um, and you know, we appreciate that. We understand it. It's budgets are probably not, they're trying to deliver their activities and services, but, but we, um, you know, we're committed to, to this process and I think it's, it, it keeps us in good stead. In terms of sustainability, so. right? Yeah, the, just looking uh, table form page or attachment form page thirty one in revenue, and just looking at grant subsidy contribution donation. So it's gone up from five point four to six point one million, so about seven hundred thousand since we adopted the budget. Um, is there any more irons in the fire, or ones that we've been received that wouldn't be showing up <coughs> in that figure at this stage? Not at this point in time, Councillor. We, we, we have a system where we, we track of all the grants that, are, that we're applying for, that we're successful for, and if, if they're, uh, they're approved and they're happening this year, um, or the cash has already come in, then we factor that into this budget review too, which is why you'll see that most of the submissions in the previous attachment, they're all primarily grant related in mm -hmm. terms of either uh, recognising where we're now committing to spend some of those grants received in prior year, or a new grants come in that we that um, we applied for in the last few months. To, to give the acknowledgement to you know, what, what will largely be state and federal governments we're getting those grants from, uh, their stimulus, the effects of their stimulus at six point one million, that'd be equivalent to about a twelve percent general rate rise. Is that right? Is it five hundred thousand? Yeah, yeah, equivalent about twelve percent general rate rise. Yeah, fund capital work through. Yeah. Wow. And just the sorry, last thing, sorry, that takes us up to 35 million in capital works, about from memory. Yeah. And so that's about 225, 230% higher than what was the case in an amalgamated council. So not only have we reduced our loans, we've increased our ability to provide um, products and services to the community by two and a half times. Um, Michael, so on page 34 you've got the statement of financial position and on the borrowings you've got a 10-year projection. Once you have this um, early, uh, we change the arrangement that you receive the loan, that, those figures are all going to change, aren't they? Correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. More of a 20-year horizon than a 10-year horizon. Correct, so we'll see more, more loans on the books over that first yeah. 10 years rather than seeing it 
then pay it off, we'll sort of see it more stable Absolutely. because we're paying it off over a longer time. We'll see the decrease in the beginning. We'll mm. see and a, uh, and a flattening out. We'll over probably it. see more of a decrease, not in the in the balance sheet, but in our operating budget where the interest will drop okay. in the short term. Just probably one comment, councillors, is that um, there were comments in the previous report around our fees and charges and sales being well above budget, which um, probably the question is why hasn't that fed through to the budget review, where the response to that is that we, we try to still play a nice a conservative approach here to our budget um, in terms of particularly COVID over the next few months. So rather than take up any upside revenue now, we, we want to hold the line let that flow through into early next year and then see where we're at and if things hold and, and you know we remain in a good position as we are now and there's no second or third waves, um, we can then um, we'll budget review three will probably be a bit, there'll be more more transactions flowing through budget review three, particularly with our revenue as well. Thank you, Michael. And while we're talking things budget, Michael, for those who are listening and are interested, um, the uh, consultation around the 21-22 budget process, the public consultation. Mm. What can you tell us about uh, any reporting that's going to come to council about what shape that may take? When can we expect a report on that perhaps? So the the budget engagement will commence for next year's budget. Um, we will be bringing a report to the January round for ratification by council on a process and approach. Um, and then we'll have to move fairly quickly to implement. So, um, you know, there's been a few things happening at the moment that's delayed sort of getting that report to council, but there'll be um, definitely in the January round, there'll be a report for discussion and agreement on the process, and then we'll, we'll be looking to kick that off imminently after that to start getting community involvement in our budget process yes. for 21-22. One quick question, Michael, um, and I just can't seem to find it in the financial report. Um, where do we absorb insurance costs? Um, so flood insurance, public liability, where, where's that captured in the report? There's um, probably not specifically um, identified as a line item, but there is within materials and services. We, have, materials. Um, we have an insurance expense budget, um, governance, holds that budget. So yep. generally what that is, is um, if we have to pay excess on an insurance claim, or we actually settle a claim that we think we don't we don't really need to um, to put that through our insurer, then I think that's a $50,000 budget that um, sits within governance to address okay. those. And there's also a budget, minor budget in fleet for, for um, minor insurance claims on our, our vehicles and plant that we don't want to um, claim because they're given value, so low value. Okay. Just to add to, to Michael's comments, that in the previous agenda item on page 21, yep. uh, attachment to the final attachment, is actually a breakdown of some oh, of our key materials Fantastic. and services categories, such yep. as legal fees, utility charges, yep. insurance, mm -hmm. um, which, which covers both the premium and the excess for any claims that come through for the year. And given that we're coming into um, storm season. Um, mm. Council set aside money in the disaster contingent contingency fund. What is that amount? Can you refresh my memory? What is that amount and currently? It's always kept at a certain level. Great quick, yeah. It's we in our a restricted cash policy which is um, on our internet. So it's a council policy we keep that uh, restricted cash reserve for disaster management. Um, at five percent of general rates, gross general rates. So I think at the moment it's around a bit over two million that's sit, sitting in our in our free cash to respond to any any emergent events that might occur over the next few months. Um, but keeping in mind, if it's a de declared disaster, then we do get funding from support yeah. funding from the federal government. So we use this for minor disasters, perhaps if we need. To. Yeah, or our usually there's a, a, a amount council needs to contribute, but if there is a local or a event that's not declared a disaster, then council would need to fund that. Trent, Trent, just a quick question, looking at that insurance, are we under, we're, we're under budget on that, aren't we? So currently, currently just, yeah. So, yeah. so obviously that might move a bit during the year, we yeah. pay our premiums early in the year, um, but we might, depending on the level of, of claims, 
yeah. made during the year that might that might trickle over later in the year at, yeah. at this point okay. in time. So we're trending well at this point in time. Yep. All right. Thank you. We have a move for the, the motion with Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Derisovic. Amelia, you wish to speak the motion? No, just thank you for hard work. Um, appreciated and noticed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Likewise, acknowledge the hard work of staff and uh, the sound financial position that you uh, we find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah. it has been a monster year, and um, we hope we will uh, have a restorative and restful Christmas. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Yeah. Quite relaxed. I've been away holidays for two weeks. Two budgets you have to produce this year. Thank you. Michael saving. Michael saving the good news to be our three instead of bringing it out for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Can't, you know, Mr. Conservative, come on. <laughs> oh, I was just thinking of Grinch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those in favour? That's Thank unanimous. You. Thank you. I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.